This is the do-it-yourself guide to business buying. Today, we're talking about due diligence. Welcome, business buyers. What is our goal with this video, due diligence? Well, I want to explain due diligence, and I'm going to do it two ways. I'm going to start with a broad overview to give you that bird's eye view of what due diligence is. I'm going to follow it up with a detailed explanation that really explains every piece of due diligence. Let's start with that broad overview. In the overview, I want to take a look at the basic questions. Who's involved? What is involved in due diligence? Where do we do it? When does it happen? Why do we do due diligence? And how do we go about it? That's what we're going to cover in the broad overview. Let's start with who. We need to discuss the business, of course, with the business owners, but also managers of different departments. If there's technical specialists, we want access to them. If they have an external accountant, we want to talk to that external accountant. Customers and distribution, we'd like to be able to discuss the business with them. Might have to be on the down low, but we'd like that to be part of it. Others as needed, of course, it's going to change from business to business. Really, any source of insider information is fair game. What is due diligence? Well, there's a number of things involved. Number one, we want to verify the claims or facts that have been made by the seller. The representations made by the seller, now we're going to verify them. We also want to gain a deeper insight into the past, present, and future of this business. And of course, look for hidden issues that might impact the future success we're going to have owning this business. When it comes to what, we want the due diligence to be comprehensive, exhaustive, detail-oriented, progressive, and customized. I'll explain all of those a little bit later on. Where does due diligence happen? Of course, at the target business location, but we will typically set up off-site meeting places as well. Online meetings happen on Zoom or some other meeting platform, and the seller will typically set up an online data room as well for documents review. Very handy. We'll explain how that works too. When does due diligence happen? After the letter of intent is signed, but before the buy-sell agreement is signed. Before we sign a definitive purchase agreement, we want the due diligence to be completed. Why do we do due diligence? Primarily to identify the next steps. Is this going to be a go or a no-go? Are we buying this business or not? If it's a go, sometimes as a result of due diligence, we need to make an adjustment to the terms based upon what we've discovered. And of course, that leads to more negotiations. But we also do it to help us in post-acquisition planning, to identify issues, and to help us formulate a plan for how we're going to deal with those issues. How do we do due diligence? Well, typically four things. A written questionnaire, the DDQ, the due diligence questionnaire. We want written answers to written questions. We want to do document review, leases, contracts, etc. We want to interview key people. We've already alluded to that. But we also want to do inspections. We want to take a look at the premises, look at distribution, and look at other important elements of the business. That's the broad overview. Now let's jump into the detailed explanations. Starting with what is the purpose of due diligence, we touched on it briefly. Let's go into more detail. We're acquiring solid information on the business we are targeting to determine our next steps in the business buying process. We talked about that, but what are these potential next steps? Number one, as a result of due diligence, we could just put out a hard stop and just stop this acquisition process altogether if unfixable conditions are uncovered that we can't do anything about. We're just going to unwind the acquisition. That's going to be it. That's pretty severe, but it certainly happens. Number two, we might have to pause the acquisition process. When deal breaker conditions are uncovered, but a potential fix is available, it's only potential, we want to review our ability to remediate the situation. So we're going to put the acquisition on pause. It might end up being dead. We might come up with a fix, but we're going to put it on pause and find out. Number three, sometimes as a result of due diligence, we have to reduce the purchase price. If problems are uncovered that affect valuation, hey, we got to revalue the business and then lower the price, which is going to require us to reopen negotiations. Sometimes people don't like this idea of reopening negotiations. They think, oh, we worked so hard to get an agreement. Now we want to reopen it. But hey, that's the way business acquisitions work. If they made a bunch of claims that really don't hold water, you have to do the right thing. Reopen the negotiations, come what may. Number four, as a result of due diligence, we may decide we want to reduce the closing payment. If uncertainty is found that investors won't accept, we may be in a position where we have to move more risk to the seller by reducing the closing payment and maybe increasing the seller note. And of course, that'll require reopening negotiations as well. Number five, sometimes due diligence results in us wanting to introduce or increase an earnout into the structure. If claims were made that are dependent upon future cash flow, which now seems a little bit more iffy, we might want to move more risk to the seller and introduce an earnout or increase the earnout already in place, which will require reopening some negotiations. 
That's another possible outcome of due diligence. Number six, we might decide we have to raise equity for the deal. If the due diligence reveals a diminished borrowing capacity, we can't borrow as much money as we thought we could, primarily because the assets aren't worth as much as the seller told us they were worth. That's going to reduce the debt available. That may require an equity injection. So that's a possible result of due diligence. That's going to cause a delay and some other issues, but it might be a direction we decide to go. Number seven, make specific post-acquisition plans as a result of due diligence. Why? To address the issues that were raised in due diligence and assess the risks they introduce. I mean, it could be almost anything. But due diligence is a deep dive into the business. Issues come up and we think, hey, we're going to buy the company, but we need to be prepared to deal with X, Y, and Z when we own this business. When does due diligence happen and why? Let's go to the business buying cycle. We've seen it before. We find a deal and we work towards closing that deal. Once we find that deal, discovery starts. We have a seller meeting. There's financial analysis, some negotiations, and eventually we put out a detailed offer. Now, we know from previous videos that detailed offer is non-legally binding, but I want to add something here related to due diligence. This is not a blind offer. It's based on something. What is it based on? Well, the information that's been given to us by the seller. Really, it's a solicitation. They make information available for the purposes of soliciting an offer from us. And of course, it's also based upon the assumptions that we make. People don't realize how many assumptions they make in this kind of a situation. We're always filling in the blanks, almost subconsciously, to make it make sense. If there's missing information, we have a tendency to supply it through the assumptions that we make. We move from the detailed offer to the letter of intent. Same thing, it's non-legally binding. It's also based upon the information given and the assumptions that we make. Now when it's time to close the deal, right, get the buy-sell agreement signed, now all of a sudden it's legally binding. So now we take the precaution before we actually sign that legally binding buy-sell agreement to verify. It's time to verify the information that we were given and the assumptions that we made. And that is what due diligence is. That's where it happens in the business buying cycle. Now, how is due diligence practically carried out? We mentioned there's four ways, a written questionnaire, the due diligence questionnaire, interviews with key people, documents review, and inspections, premises, distributions, retail, whatever it happens to be. So just think of it as four things, the questionnaire, interviews, documents, and inspections. The specifics do differ deal to deal. But I do want to touch a little bit on the written questionnaire. I want to make a couple of points. The written questionnaire, the DDQ, we want to verify the information we were given and the assumptions that we made. Why does it have to be written? Because we want the seller on the record. The answers they give us to these written questions are going to form part of the representations that we're going to include in the binding purchasing agreement. So that's why we want written questions, written answers. Next question, is the intensity of the due diligence always the same? What am I getting at here? Well, due diligence is sometimes described as light or heavy. What's the difference? Right? Well, the difference is how much thoroughness we apply to the due diligence exercise. What does it depend upon? Well, a lot of people think of it as being dependent upon the closing payment seller note ratio. What do I mean there? How big is the closing payment? How big is the seller note? And then the intensity of the due diligence kind of lines up. I'm not saying that this is the way it should be, but this is very often the way people think about it. And if the closing payment is small, then they'll think, you know what, the due diligence could be a little bit lighter in that situation. If we're making almost the entire purchase price as part of our closing payment, that's the circumstance where we'll see a little bit heavier due diligence. And so due diligence really varies with respect to how big the closing payment is. What is the thinking behind that? Well, the idea is the greater the seller note, the greater the risk to the seller the less risk to the buyer, and the less due diligence that's needed. I'm not sure that's entirely true, but if you think that way, there are definitely limits. What do I mean? I mean, when it comes to closing payment and due diligence, it doesn't matter how small the closing payment is, we're going to have to make sure we don't skimp too hard on that due diligence. For example, we never skip legal due diligence, regardless of how small or big the closing payment is. So what are the descriptive features of due diligence? Well, we mentioned in the broad overview that we want due diligence to be comprehensive, exhaustive, detail-oriented, progressive, and customized. Let's go through them one at a time. Let's start with comprehensive. What are we getting at there? We want to cast a wide net when it comes to due diligence. We want to cover as many aspects of the business as possible. 
I want to briefly review 15 different areas that we can potentially investigate in our acquisitions. They might not necessarily be applicable for every specific deal, but let's take a look at 15 different areas. Starting with the big one, financial due diligence. Starting with the financial statements, the income statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flow. Of course, we're going to review those in due diligence. Now, how much digging do we need to do when it comes to the financial statements? To me, that's a function of whether they're audited, in which case we won't have to do all that much digging. If they're reviewed, we have some assurance. So again, it's fairly limited. But if the statements are just compiled, meaning no accountant's been involved in reviewing them or auditing them, we're going to have to do a fair amount of digging. And of course, 95% of businesses in the less than $10 million space have compiled financial statements. So that means there is going to be a fair amount of digging. In terms of financial due diligence, we want to look at the age reports, age receivables, age payables, tax returns, of course, for multiple years, making a special note of whether they use cash accounting or accrual accounting. Profitability metrics are also important in financial due diligence, gross margins and net margins, a trend analysis over time, and industry comparisons between other businesses in this industry. We'll take a look at solvency metrics like the current ratio and the quick ratio. We want to understand working capital requirements. As part of that discussion, we'll look at leverage metrics, how leveraged is the business, things like debt to equity ratio. Financial due diligence includes future projections, a monthly cash flow, preferably two to three years in the future, and of course, historic results for all the metrics that we're noting. And just basically financial due diligence, we like to look at financial ratios in a wide variety of different perspectives from profit, solvency, leverage to operations. And so that's financial due diligence. That's only the first of the 15. Next up, legal due diligence. Some of the 15 areas get skipped depending on the deal. Legal due diligence is not one of them. We do that for every single deal. We'll look at incorporation, make sure there's no legal loose ends. $100 million company, there probably wouldn't be. A $2 million company, yeah, there might be. We'll take a look at the ownership. If it's an LLC, they have members. If it's a C Corp, we have a share register. We'll take a look at decision making, shareholder agreements, operating agreements, depending upon the nature of the legal entity. We'll take a look at contracts, customer contracts, supplier contracts, third party contracts. We want to take a look at leases, premises, equipment, pending disputes. Is there litigation outstanding or warranty claims or is anything on the horizon? If we're buying assets, one other thing you want to keep in mind is what legal agreements have to be assigned or conveyed if we're buying the assets. If we're buying the shares, we don't have this issue to the same degree. But if we're buying assets, it is a fairly big issue. It's going to get covered off in due diligence. Number three, operational due diligence. What does the workflow look like? Take a look at the efficiencies of the task. Take a look at whatever bottlenecks they are. You want to take a look at the operational side of the business. It often gets downplayed in due diligence. Take a look at the systems and tools. What kind of software are they using? Equipment, machinery, is it up to date? Or are capital expenditure requirements on the horizon where some of this stuff is going to need to be updated? Capacity and scalability. Do we have the skills, equipment, and people to exploit the growth potential that's open to us as new owners? Quality control. How about certifications like ISO or internal standards? Do we have vulnerability there? Standard operating procedures. Do they have them? Do they have checklists? Do they have written SOPs? Take a look at that in due diligence. We want to take a look at operational risk. What about supply chain disruptions or equipment failures? How vulnerable are we to those? Next, we're going to move on to market and industry analysis. Market size and growth potential is important. How big is our available market? How much is it growing year over year? Who are our competitors? What's their market share? What are their strengths and weaknesses? What about industry trends and dynamics? Is it being impacted by technology breakthroughs or change in habits or other disruptors? Take a look at that. We want to know what the dependencies are. Are we dependent on specific industry conditions? Sometimes we are. Ask some questions, get to the bottom of it. How about market position and brand perception? Do we have some brand recognition of the products or services this business sells? Do we have demonstrated customer loyalty? Take a look at that. What are barriers to entry for people competing in this particular business? Whether it's technology, location, regulatory, or capital, has this business erected any barriers to entry? Very important. Number five, human resources has to be taken a look at in due diligence. What's the workforce composition? We take a look at the employees. How many are full-time? How many are part-time? How many are contractors versus employees? How many are professionals? How many people are working on line jobs where they're revenue or production oriented versus staff jobs? All these things are good to know. What about compensation and benefits? Are they being paid market salaries? Do they have competitive benefits? That's going to help us on the turnover side. What's the structure and management organizationally? What are the reporting relationships? What does the decision-making hierarchy even look like? Human resource due diligence. 
How do employee relations look and what's morale like? Are there existing disputes, ongoing dissatisfaction? Make sure you take a look at that. Training and development should be an item of interest. How do they do their onboarding? Are there opportunities for professional development? What about employee retention? What does the turnover rates look like? What's the size of the local talent pool? We know we're facing talent shortages and employee shortages in certain areas. Is that going to impact your business and your location? Number six, customer and sales analysis. What's the customer base composition look like? Are they selling to commercial clients, consumers? Are they selling to big businesses or small businesses? Do they have specific target industries? How does the revenue break down? How much of it is recurring revenue versus repeat business versus one-time sales? You should have a number for all of those. How about customer retention and loyalty? What is the turnover rate? Do they have loyalty programs? Take a look at that. Sales trends and performance. Is the sales seasonal in any way? Are there specific growth patterns that we've noted? What about sales channels and distribution? Do they sell direct? Do they sell online? Do they sell through distributors or through retail? Again, you should be able to put a numerical percentage on each one. What about customer acquisition costs and strategies? Taking a look at channel breakdown and profile breakdown. We want to take a close look at supplier and vendor evaluations. We've already talked a little bit about dependency analysis. We want to make sure we're not sole sourced in any important input. What is the input risk analysis? Make an effort to know where the risks lie on the supplier side. What about supplier performance and reliability, right? Do we have quality suppliers, good delivery times that respond to our issues? That's something worth checking in due diligence. How about vendor diversity and alternatives? Alternative suppliers, we have flexibility. There's some built-in resilience in the supply chain. Yeah, this is important. Number eight, IT and technology assessment. Starting with the IT infrastructure, we're just going to take an inventory and an audit of the hardware servers, networks, and data center. What do we have? We'll take a look at the software systems and the applications. How do they handle office communications? What CRM tools do they use? Are they using an ERP system? We want to take a look at cybersecurity and data protection. Is there intrusion detection or data encryption? Privacy compliance is huge in Europe. And of course, small companies don't usually have to worry about high-level attacks, but it is something that should be on your radar screen. What about the digital assets, websites, e-commerce platforms, digital content? In terms of management services, what's the level of dependency we're getting from our managed services? What's the quality of support they provide? What actual services are under managed services that are being provided? And of course, disaster and recovery is important. Business continuity. You know, how do they handle system failures, data loss, disaster recovery? Going through these quickly, but want to give you a feel. When you take a look at the due diligence questionnaire, you'll have more time to sort of go through these one by one and absorb them. I'm just giving you the 10,000 foot view, but let's keep going. Next is intellectual property review, starting with a patent analysis. What patents does the business own? Do they have any pending? And are they potentially infringing on anybody else's patents? Same drill with trademark examination. Do they have registered trademarks, any pending? And is there any chance that they are potentially infringing on other people's trademarks? We look at it from both ends. Copyright and creative works we take a look at. That includes software code, written materials, artistic works. We want to review the IP. What about trade secrets and confidential information? Do they have safeguards in place to protect them? Do they have standards associated with trade secrets and confidential information? It is an important concept for some businesses. What about licensing agreements, both sides? Things that they are licensing and things that they license, both licensor and licensee. Is the business dependent upon a license? If so, which one? And is there vulnerability? Is there any chance of that going away? These are things that are not always obvious, which is why we do due diligence. What about the strategic value of the intellectual property? Does it provide any competitive advantage? Does it support any market positioning? We want to take a look at what the relationship of the business success is to intellectual property from a strategic perspective. Number 10, environmental due diligence. We're looking at environmental permits and licenses. Are they current? Are they compliant with regulatory requirements? What about waste management practices? Take a look at their disposal methods, their waste reduction, their recycling. Is that all up to standards? What about resource usage and sustainability? Energy efficiency, of course, is important, and so is water conservation. Do either one of those issues affect this business? Take a look at that in due diligence. Number 11, of course, we have to take a look at tax due diligence. We want to review tax returns and payments across the board, federal, state, local taxes. Are they up to date? Is there a nexus with any other state? This is a U.S. example, of course. States where sales are made, is there any nexus vulnerability? 
If you are found to be in nexus with another state, that state's sales tax applies to you. And so we always have to be on the lookout to determine whether we are or not developing a nexus in other states where we operate. Payroll tax review. Withholdings, contributions, remittances, are they all in order? Worker classification review. Do they have employees that they're treating as contractors? This is super important if you're buying the shares because you're inheriting all that liability. Assessment of tax liabilities. Do they have unpaid taxes? Do they have underreported income? Overclaimed deductions. If you're buying shares, you're inheriting the tax history of the business. So these are things that you have to take a look at. And an examination of tax controversies or disputes is also a good idea. Previous audits, previous litigation, previous settlements. Make sure that you don't buy the shares of a business without knowing the tax history of that business. Number 12, regulatory compliance checks that are industry specific. There are industry standards that have to be met, disclosures that might have to be met, and other qualifications. Make sure that they're up to par on those. What about employment and labor law compliance? Things like minimum wage and overtime rules and safety training. Are they compliant in all those areas? And of course, environmental regulation compliance is important on both the waste side, hazardous materials if they have any, air quality, health and safety regs, of course. Are safety restraints up to snuff? How about accidents, injury claims? We want to look into that if safety is an issue for this business. Data protection and privacy laws, they are universal. Protection of credit card numbers, proper encryption. If you're doing business in Europe or in Canada, you have GDPR and Pipetta on the privacy side. And of course, licensing and permit requirements. State licenses are really important in some businesses, being regulated by specific industry bodies, permits, etc. 13, insurance and risk management. We want to review all the insurance policies, liability, property, workers' compensation, errors and emissions. Make sure you do an analysis of the claims history, patterns and issues and problems associated with claims that have been made. And of course, when it comes to risk, we also want to take a look at the contractual liabilities and indemnification that we have. Take a look at the contracts. What kind of contractual obligations is this business under if you're buying the shares and inheriting the legal position of the business? Do they have indemnification obligations as well? Take a look. 14, cultural assessment, employee engagement and morale. Take a look at that. Team building, is that a thing? Recognition, turnover. We want to take a pulse there. Training and development, we looked at it in a different area. Now we're looking at it from a culture perspective. Do people have opportunities for training and development? Are they engaged in training and development? And is it growing in this business? What about diversity and inclusion? Open opportunities for everybody. Diversity in hiring is important. And last, strategic fit and synergies. Sometimes there are revenue synergies. This is for people who run a business and are buying another business. If you're an individual, these things won't typically apply. But revenue synergies can happen through cross-selling, expanded offerings, improved positioning. That might be one of the reasons why you're buying the business. Check them out. Make sure it's real. Cost synergies, economies of scale, consolidated operations, streamlined processes. Don't take it at lip service. Don't do a superficial analysis. Get into the details. Of course, there's shared knowledge and expertise, right? We're sharing knowledge, expertise, and best practices with the target business. What can we learn? These are all the things that you want to take a look at in due diligence. When it comes to comprehensive and casting a wide net, we obviously took only a superficial look at these areas. We need much better coverage, of course, when we're doing due diligence. And when you take a look at the questionnaire on the DIY site, you'll see what I mean. But that's comprehensive. So what's exhaustive all about? What does that mean? in the context of due diligence. It means you go deep in each area. You do as much digging in each business area as possible, staying focused, of course, on the claims they're making, the facts they're presenting, the opinions they're offering, the documents they're presenting, and the facilities that you're inspecting. Now, when it comes to due diligence, like I said, you're going to find a sample due diligence question bank on the DIY business buying site. Make sure you check it out. That will bring a lot of what we're talking about in this particular presentation to life. But where are we right now? Let's do a little bit of a recap. We have comprehensive due diligence, meaning casting a wide net. We have exhaustive due diligence, meaning we go deep in each area. And together, combine, it's really an exercise in going fishing. We're looking to identify all potential issues. That's the goal. In terms of handling the due diligence questionnaire, we create a question bank or a question pool. That's what I do. We include every question imaginable. We add to it over time covering each of the area that we've mentioned and maybe a couple that weren't mentioned, and then we add to it over time. For each individual deal, we handpick questions from the bank. So we take a subset 
of the entire pool of questions for a specific deal that we're working on. And then we add deal-specific questions that maybe are not currently in the question bank. And that's a good approach to take when you're doing due diligence. So comprehensive plus exhaustive. One thing I do want to mention, it's important to balance. What do I mean there? These are small businesses. We are motivated to uncover all the issues, but we do have to be careful that we don't overwhelm the sellers. Very often, these are small operators. They don't have the capacity to deal with an absolute onslaught of due diligence questions and investigations. So you do have to be a little bit selective. You do have to worry about the balance. We want to have all the questions in front of us, you know, so we can sort of highlight and prioritize the ones that are important. But we don't want to do a due diligence that's worthy of a $1 billion company if we're buying one that's a $2 million company. So I'm fully aware that there is a balancing act that has to occur. When it comes to due diligence, right, whether we're doing due diligence that's light or, you know, medium or heavy, it is a significant issue in the SMB space. It does require some nuance and finesse. And I guess if I was going to encapsulate it in a single sentence, going overboard on due diligence can be an issue. And so that's why you want to be careful when you're combining comprehensive and exhaustive. Now let's move to detail-oriented. Let's see how it works. Hey, we ask a lot of questions, and the answers we get have to meet certain standards. And so that's part of the due diligence is to have a framework in terms of what you want to see in the answers you get. We want them to be accurate, of course, and precise. We want them to be tangible, also detailed. We want them to be unambiguous. And we want them to be evidence-based. That's my list. That's my framework in terms of the standards. I want the answers I get in due diligence to meet. And we essentially score each question, not formally, not with a tool, but informally, we want to go down the list. Is the answer we got accurate, precise, tangible, detailed? Let's say it is for some specific question. But the last two don't really meet the standards. There's some ambiguity in the answer, and it's not clear that it's evidence-based. If that's the case then the question is not considered to be answered. We don't just move on. We're not looking for responses. We're looking for an answer. And so we go back and we clear up those two items, get rid of the ambiguity, make sure that it's evidence-based, and only then do we consider the question to be answered. We aren't looking for responses. We are looking for answers. And so that's what we mean by detail-oriented. What about progressive? Well, I look at it this way. Let's say we ask 100 written questions on our due diligence questionnaire. And when we take a look at the responses, nine of the questions were skipped, no answer was given, three were incomplete, five, we got an ambiguous or vague answer. For seven, the answer prompted a new question. And in 76 of the 100, we got a detailed answer that requires no follow-up. I would only consider that to be round one completed. If questions remain unanswered, we move to a second round. Yes, we're not going to re-ask the 76, but we're going to re-ask some of the ones that we asked and didn't get an answer to. So we're going to have some new follow-up questions as well. And that's what's going to go into round number two. So when it comes to due diligence, we definitely submit a second set of questions if we don't get complete answers that meet our standards on the questions that we ask. And that's what progressive means. We don't leave important questions unanswered. We progressively add rounds until we get a satisfactory answer. Remember, answers are what we want, not responses. And so that's what we mean by progressive. Finally, customized. Well, we start with questions from a question bank, but deal-specific questions are added. The DDQ is not 100% off the shelf. Having said that, non-relevant questions can hurt the credibility of the buyer, but it's a bit of a tough issue. I mean, the better the questions, the easier it is to be thorough. But at the same time, we don't always know whether questions are relevant. That's why we're asking them. So in a fishing expedition, you ask a lot of questions you yourself may not think are relevant, but you ask them anyway just to get a written confirmation. But that's what we mean by customized. Last topic, it's using data rooms. Just want to give you a quick overview of what a data room is. It's a secure online repository for storing and sharing critical business documents. It's set up by the seller. It's controlled by the seller. It facilitates organized exchange of confidential and sensitive information. So really helpful to have an online data room. You know, it streamlines the review of the company's financials, legal, and business documents. It's a centralized platform for document management, ensuring efficiency and confidentiality. The seller can see who saw which documents and when. 
really gives them a sense of control that they appreciate. And then we organize the documents in a structured manner, which includes indexing and search features. That enables a really quick and easy access if you're an authorized user, and of course, saves a great deal of time and resources, not to mention travel time, etc. I mean, due diligence is important in deal making, and it does need to be mastered. Efficiency and low cost are both critical. We can't start spending 25 or 30% of the purchase price funding the due diligence exercise. You know, it's typically got to be less than 10%, preferably less than five. So have a plan and work it. After all, due diligence is the last formal off-ramp for the buyer. So it pays off to do it right. Of course, we can always back out right till the very last minute, but it can be a little bit ugly if we do it at the 11th hour. Due diligence is an official off-ramp for the buyer. So we're treating it very seriously. That's it for due diligence. Next video up is finalizing the financing. Let's get after it. This is the do-it-yourself guide to business buying. And today we've been talking about due diligence because we always want to learn and grow as we go. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.